Hello, welcome to MySQL QA episode number 3. Today we'll go into debugging. We'll play around with GDB, uh, which is a great Linux utility for debugging. We'll have a look into backtraces or stack traces. They're pretty much the same thing, or they are the same thing. We'll look into frames, library dependencies. Uh, you can also see we're having a look at some commands that we can use within GDB, how to analyze variables, um, what sort of library dependencies you need and how you can easily uh, put them uh, in a bug report along with your core dump. Uh, C++ filled uh, as a handy utility. And we uh, will also have a look into some of uh, uh, the PDFs that I've prepared earlier uh, for a conference, which might be handy just to delve a little bit deeper if you want to. Okay, great. Uh, let's get into it. So, in the first instance, we'll have a look uh, into uh, GDB. So, how can you think about GDB? Well, first, uh, let us assume that we have uh, a MySQL server. So, here's your MySQL server and at some point something goes wrong so we will have a bug in, in your MySQL server if you will. Now when this happens when MySQL crashes, the MySQL server crashes uh, and, and don't forget uh, MySQL, uh, the MySQL daemon is uh, called MySQL D uh, in Linux uh, the same in Windows, by the way. And so let's assume that MySQL D crashes. It will create a core dump. Now, what will we do with the core dump? We will need to analyze the core dump. What is the core dump? It's simply a file, right? So it's a file. And we will be able to analyze that file uh, with the utility GDB. So we will look into all these things um, a, a a bit more in a minute and it will make much more sense how this file looks, how we connect it into GDB, etc. But for the moment all you have to remember is, okay, so we have a MySQL server, MySQL D, uh, it crashes, it will generate a core dump. What is a core dump? It's basically the state of things as they are in memory at the point of the crash of MySQL D and we're going to take that file and analyze it with GDB. Okay, great. So let's get started. Now, here in the background, um, I have a pQuery running. pQuery, you probably heard about this. It's our uh, great tool. Uh, I just ran it uh, yesterday for a particular uh, issue that we were trying to analyze, and we let it run with uh, 12 threads for 24 hours, and it was able to generate almost 2,500 core dumps, 2,500 crashes of MySQL. So if you think uh, that MySQL is buggy, it is. Um, and uh, that goes across the board. So it's not just uh, Upstream's uh, MySQL server or Pagona server or MariaDB. Uh, all of these have their own set of problems and their own set of issues. Uh, of course, we need to work on them and improve the quality, but you can see there is still much work for all of these to be done. So pQuery here is running and it's just doing uh, 25 second trials. You can see sometimes it reaches a timeout, uh, sometimes it finds a crash. So here you have a crash and you can see here already a reference uh, core dumped, which means that um, a core file was generated and uh, saved saved to disk. So that's uh, what you would see. Um, and here you see the number of crashes it has found so far. So in this case, four. So four seems like a reasonable uh, number to start with. Let's just scroll up a little bit and see. Okay, so this is one particular bug which we which we see a lot of time. Uh, timer equals null. You can see it here again reproduced. Would be great if we had two or three different uh, crashes, but but it's enough to get started. So let me just, uh, oh, here's one more that's being found right as we speak. Uh, so you can see within 25 seconds uh, the service crashed. Oh great, we got another uh, core dump, uh, another 
a crash happening and not a core file and this time with a with a different crash as before so before we were seeing a particular uh, assertion uh, that said uh, timer equals null is not supposed to happen here in this case uh, it looks like we got a more severe uh, signal 11 crash um, oh, and as we speak here there's one more that's coming up so I'm just gonna let that finish oh great yet another crash okay so let me just Control C out of that, and I'm going to just note the working directory here. Let's jump into here. So we're, I'm just going to run a little utility, which is going to make it easier for me to see what sort of issues um, that we're seeing here. Okay, whoops, we've got a little error there. I fixed that uh, already in the background. So let me just uh, run that again. Okay, so here it is going through, and it's actually using GDB for this particular bash script already in the background, and you can see it's extracting uh, queries from the uh, core dump and um, and also analyzing what particular issue it's seeing. So this is just a little hand utility which will allow me to uh, quickly analyze what sort of issues we're seeing. Okay, great. So pretty much everything up to now, you can see that as a little bit of interesting information about pQuery. Have a play with it if you're into QA or if you just like to go ahead and crash uh, MySQL D a few times or maybe you got a new storage engine that you want to test. Go ahead and play with it. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit more probably in other videos. So at the moment, what we're going to look at is um, what uh, what sort of issues we're seeing and here uh, in a handy way gives me the trial numbers and, and as we were saying before this particular issue uh, is coming up uh, quite a few times so let's start maybe with that one so we're going to two and so we have your data directory and um, here you can see what a core dump looks like. So this is literally a core dump and you can see by the size that indeed it's probably written out part of the memory, buffers, uh, whatever else it had to write out to make sure that it's got a good snapshot of the information of what MySQL D was running at the time. So this is a standard data directory. If um, you want to configure MySQL D to dump one of these files, you might have to do a few things. You can search on the Pagona blog or uh, elsewhere online to find uh, how to configure it. Basically, what you want to do in your my.cnf, um, you want to uh, somewhere in the MySQL D section, you want to add something like uh, dash dash core file. Uh, in the past, dash core worked, but I think it's uh, been uh, removed now, so you have to use a core file. But you still have to set up, if this is a production system, you still have to set up your system uh, in a correct way to ensure that it will actually allow you to write core files and whatever. You can also send them in a particular, into a particular location. You also have to think about things whether you are running an optimized or you know what is generally known as a generally available uh, optimized build, uh, which is what most uh, of our customers would be using, or whether you are using a debug build. So in these cases I'm using what's called a debug build. So there's three types of builds. Um, and it's somewhat important that you understand the differences. So let me just remove this because it's no longer very related so you know how to set up core files and you can also have a look into the uh, handy PDF files that I will share at the end of this talk and it will give you a little bit more information about how to set up uh, core dumps. So coming back to this, so optimized, uh, as we said, that's what uh, customers would use. Uh, debug is what most of us in QA would use and uh, developers might use at uh, various debug debug times. And Valgrind is uh, pretty much the same as debug, uh, but it also has Valgrind instrumentation within the code, which means that if we run the uh, certain, if we run MySQL D under Valgrind, so just picture Valgrind as a little program or utility, and within that you run MySQL D, um, and so you might start seeing uh, various issues uh, pop up. 
um, for instance, a memory allocation issue or some buffer overrun, or in other words, something that wasn't coded properly, then Valgrind will uh, pick up on these issues and it will report them as uh, errors uh, of, uh, coming through the Valgrind output. Um, how can this work? By having some sort of instrumentation inside the MySQL decode that allows um, that allows Valgrind to communicate that uh, with with this code while the program is running. So um, unless you're in QA, you're probably not going to use Valgrind uh, very much at all. In this case, we're simply running a debug build. So okay, let's get started. How can we access this core file if we simply try to edit it? Not a good idea, as you can see, it's just a binary file. I hope I can even get out of this. Okay, there we go. So, yeah, basically it's just a binary file uh, full of information. So it's not like you can go and edit this file or have a look at uh, anything inside. So how do we access it? We use a program like GDB. And there's other debugging programs, but GDB is probably one of the most used ones and also uh, one of the ones that's most known. So what we want to do is we want to point it to uh, the binary. Uh, in this case, in this case, we um, have a copy of the binary here, and then we point it to the core file. Like this. Okay, so that went a little bit quick. So we've basically pointed it to the MySQL D binary. So the format is always GDB binary core dump. Uh, and if you remember the little drawing earlier, it sort of makes sense. So um, here you see GDB starting and the version at some points can be quite important because if you have too old a version of GDB, it will not recognize uh, certain things within uh, the code or how it's compiled. So you want to make sure that you've got a reasonably recent version. Um, you can see that here a number of items are apparently happening automatically. This is not really automatic. I'll show you in a minute uh, how, how these uh, uh, come in here like this. Uh, it reads the symbols and now if you really remember the, the debug so versus the optimized. So think about this, if you have an optimized server um, the name itself says it already, uh, the server is very limited in debugging capabilities. The code was optimized to remove most of the symbols uh, from MySQL D and what that means is you won't be able to see as much information or to decompile your stack trace and we'll see more about what that means in a minute um, as you would with a debug build. So with a debug build it's going to be a little bit bigger and slower um, but it's going to nicely always have your uh, symbols in there which is not always the case with Optimize. In certain cases you might be able to uh, get the symbols as an add-on or you might have some limited symbol information within an optimized binary etc etc. It's a little bit mit mix and match when you start debugging. Um, Valgrind builds also have all the symbols in them because Valgrind builds are also debug builds usually. Um, that's not to say that um, I assume that you could make a, an optimized build just with Valgrind instrumentation but not with symbols but generally I don't think that's done. Okay so in this case it's very straightforward we're using a debug build and it's reading the symbols from the binary which is fine. Um, so it gives us a little bit more information, it says that you need certain uh, bits of debug information and so you can go ahead and copy this line and uh, install this uh, within your OS just so that you see a little bit more information about, for instance, glibc 
uh, frames within a stack trace and we'll see a bit more in a minute again what uh, what this means so let me just quit out of here for the moment and by the way if, if you're trying to do something like exit um, that doesn't work if you try to do something like control C it says quit but it doesn't quit so <laughs> you can get pretty stuck unless you actually type quit so also you might not get on your machine this uh, plus sign with a repeat of the command. Uh, this is a particular setup that I have and uh, I think it's gdb init, yes. So uh, there's a few things that I said in here. Actually these are slightly outdated. Um, I just should have it like this. So I've got trace commands is on which is the little plus sign with the command. Uh, I don't want pages uh, when I view multiple page content. I just want it all to stream across the screen because it's easier when you're logging. Um, pretty printing. Uh, I want to see my arrays and I want to see array indexes and I want to print at least 1500 uh, elements elements is, is slightly undescriptive of whatever it is I'm printing. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Just picture that you have a variable and it's this long. And picture that you have set uh, print elements to... Um, let me give you an example of a variable. Like this could be a command. Uh, select star asterisk, sorry, from t1 where and so on. So this could be uh, stored within a variable, right? So let's say that you set this to tray. Then when you are seeing the output, it will just show you the first three bits. So why is this set so high? Well, if there is a failing query, I want to see all of it, right? I want to get a good idea what it is exactly that's causing the uh, server to fail. So these are just a few handy commands that you could have within your GDB init file, within your home directory, dot GDB init, uh, to ensure that GDB is just that slightly uh, more handy to work with. So let me just get rid of this and uh, come back here. I can save this because that sounded uh, good, this update. And uh, let's just jump back into uh, um, RGDB. Now, in this case, as I said, we have a saved copy of the binary uh, together with all the required libraries. But if you are just starting out, you probably do not have a detailed setup. So you could simply, and I'm just copying here which um, one I was running from, uh, which MySQL I was running, and I could point it to the MySQL D simply like this. So with debug builds uh, we usually just keep them all within one directory. If you have um, MySQL D setting for instance in user uh, forward slash user forward slash bin that's fine too you can point it to that uh, again keep in mind that you might not have debug symbols on an optimized build so if you're a customer trying to look into your core file great that's fantastic because you know you're saving us a little bit of work but at the same time remember that you might not see as detailed an output as what we're going to see because you're probably not running a debug build which means you either have to install your debug symbols uh, as an add-on package or we might have to translate um, the output uh, etc 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 so it depends a little bit as to whether you're on one side of the fence or the other so to say so let's start this up again and you can see it it works fine it's reading the symbols again and you can see this time it's reading them from this binary okay so let's start by pointing this to an incorrect binary now GDB is kind and it tells you there's no such file or directory. The binary you're telling me that that's not going to work out. And indeed here it also reports uh, I cannot find the debug information. I cannot make any connections between uh, whatever main executable file uh, that the core was generated with and you can see here which one that was uh, and this uh, particular core that I'm reading. Now it's nice enough to tell you uh, what the uh, what binary was used to generate the core so you can go and use that one 
and uh, simply correct the error. Um, but what are some other indications? So we have one indication, two indications, and here's a third one. And if we run a full backtrace, then we get a lot more confirmation that something is wrong, right? Uh, there's no uh, resolution uh, of the stack possible because um, it doesn't have the binary. So let's jump out of here and make a slightly different mistake. This time we do this. And this happens regularly by accident, you're typing quickly, you just want to point it to some sort of server version and release, and you accidentally forget to specify slash bin slash mysql d. So in this case, it says success. So you're not going to be looking for errors straight away. But then here, it still gives you a little warning, like, hey, I'm still missing the debug information, so that should be your first warning. Here's your second warning, and indeed still no nicely resolved stack trace. So if you do see things like this, uh, usually it's some sort of binary mismatch or a missing binary altogether. Now let's look at a complete binary mismatch and this happens uh, quite regularly out in the wild. So after a while you uh, know how to uh, see when uh, an incorrect binary was used Okay, so this time we've pointed it at some 5.7 release and sure enough it can read the symbols from that file so it's not giving the missing debug information error. Uh, in fact it all looks very clean but still we see here that something is amiss. So let's just go into backtrace. Okay, now we see something even more strange. We see a partially resolved stack trace but in this case it's talking about GIS and then here it's talking about copy backward or something clearly you know something is going wrong and what's going wrong is so if you picture it we got um, BiosQL D 5.6 and and this is even more specific than 5.6 right uh, we, we need to make sure we need to make sure that we have the 100% uh, same version same type of build like uh, debug, optimized, or file grind, and uh, possibly, I, I don't know, uh, the build parameters. I can picture that if uh, you would use certain different build parameters. Um, for instance, uh, debug or optimized or file grind are some build parameters too, but I'm sure that you, know, you could find some other build parameters that if you tweak them a little bit, then you're going to have a differently rendered binary and you cannot read a mismatched binary with a mismatched core. So if you have, uh, and this is what we see here, mysql d 5.7, and you're going to be trying to read this core file uh, over here, guess what? It's not going to work. So that's what we're seeing here right now, complete mismatch between the binary and your backtrace. But notice that there were no error messages. The only thing, uh, the only way you could have figured it out was core generated by, and sure enough here it has uh, 5623, and here we're reading the symbols from another binary. Now, what do you do when you have a certain backtrace and you're a customer and this backtrace was generated by an optimized build and you would like to get a fully resolved stack trace? Well, there are different ways of going about that. You could uh, install the debug info package, you could uh, try and use one of the uh, uh, utilities that resolves uh, stack traces back into a more readable format. You can take the backtrace from the error log and run it to C++ filled and we'll see a bit more about that later on. Um, so there's a few different ways of going about it. But what about if you have an old core dump from you know two years ago and you'd, you'd like to read it and you'd like to have a look at it again but you haven't got the matching MySQL binary. Well try and find the exact 100% the same download uh, online and use the MySQL D and see if your stack trace looks nice and clean. Sometimes tiny minor version like let's say that this was uh, 5, 6, 24 um, that might work, it might not work or your stack might be slightly off. Um, the more the code is alike and the more it was built in the same way uh, the more correct it will be. In general you want to have a hundred percent match.
Okay, so let's jump out of here and now go back to our original example. Um, where is it? Let's go D. Okay, so this time it's reading it from the right bu uh, binary and look straight away, you can see a little bit more information and bingo, no more question marks. It's also able now to tell you, uh, you might just want to go ahead and install these. Um, so, you know, if, if you uh, run this uh, as sudo and install these little extra packages, then it will not just give you a uh, cleanly resolved uh, backtrace as far as MySQL D goes, but it will also give you a cleanly resolved backtrace as far as all the OS parts go. So sometimes there's a few little OS parts, like for instance this uh, particular frame uh, has called a function from an OS uh, part. Okay, and if we now run a backtrace, aha, very clean. So now we have a clean backtrace. Great. So let's start looking a little bit more into uh, what backtraces and so on are actually are. So remember, we are using uh, a debug uh, built here. So uh, these backtraces look all very nice and clean. We're going to be able to see much information. Um, that's possibly not going to be the case if you're using an optimized binary, but as I said, there's a few ways around that. Okay, so let's just remove this. So by now you should be able to identify what this is. So what are some possible names? Backtrace, stacktrace, trace. You could probably find a few other ones. They're all the same thing, so if anybody else tells you anything else uh, <laughs> don't believe it. They're all the same thing and uh, basically what it's talking about is this particular overview of whatever was happening in a particular thread on the server. So let's just first uh, start with the concept of threads. So picture your MySQL D and I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger this time um, to see what's happening inside E. So we have MySQL D running and inside MySQL D we have uh, various threads that are uh, doing various things. So does that mean that there are uh, a number, uh, a matching number of clients? Uh, no, not at all. So let's say that we have one particular client who's connected with uh, MySQL and there's one particular with the MySQL command line utility and there's one particular client who's connected via the C API uh, using some software interface or whatever. So sure enough each of these will have uh, some thread uh, between them. Uh, running within MySQL D in the server uh, and the client communicating back and forth. Um, but there is also a number of other threads, you know, background threads, threads that are doing I.O., uh, threads that are managing buffers, who, who knows what else is happening in there, only, only the developers. So what can we see when we run a backtrace? Here we've run a backtrace. Well, what, what we're actually looking at is we're looking at one particular thread, right? So one particular thread. Now in this case, this one particular thread has failed, right? Um, and we can see that here, signal handle, handler called and we can see all sorts of things going wrong, assertion and so on. So one particular thread has failed. Was this a client thread? Uh, maybe, and you can see this uh, quite regularly that it was a client thread and I'll show you a way to uh, at least get some ID. Uh, I'm not perfect at this, but I can read it a little bit. Um, the developers would be much more perfect at this than me. So I'll show you some of the things that I know and then you can uh, grow from there. Okay, so we have one particular backtrace here. Um, Let's get rid of this and let's have a look what's happening here. But first, let's look at threads. So if we go here, thread one. So here we are in thread one, right? And thread one is the one that failed. Now, how many threads are there? Well, 
let's do something else. Okay, so what command have we entered here? Thread apply all BT. So we're going to run a backtrace for all threads. Okay, great. So there's our thread one that we've already looked at. And there's the other threads. And if you remember the picture, you know, there's quite a few in the server. You can see all the things that were going on. And here's the start of our command. 25 threads were running. You know, at the time when this server crashed, 25 threads were doing things. Now, let's start with the most basic thread, the thread that had a failure. Now, will the thread that have uh, had a failure always be thread 1? No, not necessarily. Sometimes GDB gets it wrong and it will uh, put you in a thread that is not a failing thread and you have to run thread apply uh, all BT to see which one actually crashed. Sometimes two threads uh, crash at the same time. I've seen that happen too. So, okay. So what can we see in this thread information? Now, the backtrace you read from bottom to top. So when uh, MySQL D was started, it spawned off a new thread, and here you can see the spawning of the thread. Um, and part of this is handled by the OS, then MySQL D uh, takes over as running one, handle one connection, do handle one connection, one thread part connection. Okay, and then it's um, so all this seems quite general. And then it's something doing here in THD, which I assume stands for thread as well. And we can have a look. Oh, an SQL class. So, you know, there's a lot of information here. Make sure that you have a look at which file it was, right? So, this is your source code. Uh, where I downloaded it, SQL subdirectory, sqlclass.cc, the actual file, and even the fa actual line number. So you can you can go and have a look at these files. And then, so you know, this function apparently is sort of called itself because it's 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 both here. So this called this, this called this, this called this, this called this, and so on. Now this function called itself, and after that something went wrong. Right, so at the OS level, uh, an assertion failed, and so there must have been some sort of assertion in between those two here, and uh, the OS picked up on it. Uh, it uh, reports a signal handler, and um, so it reports a signal. Signal handler was called, and then uh, by that, MySQL D picks up from it again and actually starts handling that signal in the most appropriate way. So what's a signal? Basically just when there is an issue with a program, uh, there's a signal being sent back so that uh, the program uh, can either respond to it or simply it terminates. So in this case, great, uh, a core file was written and that's in fact the one we're working with now. And you can see this is still all within the code. It's right there for you to see. Uh, in this case, it's a C, not a C++ file. And finally, the server was killed off. So you can see fairly well what happened here, right? Straight away, we know, okay, you know, somewhere in this THG, there's going to be an issue. By the way, the frame, these are frames, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute, the frame that is directly under the assertion messages is usually the one that's look very interesting for searching in Google with. So you could grab this little bit of information and then maybe say something like assertion or assert and um, in this case this is maybe a little bit general but if it was something like this, for example, um, you know, that's much more specific. Sometimes what I do is I uh, grab uh, one, in this case it's the same, but let's assume it's different. One, two, three, four, five, or so six frames from the stack directly under the assertion message and all enter them with spaces in Google. So in this case, um, it could be something like uh, this assert, right? Something like this you could type into Google and uh, see if the particular crash is there already. Now you might not want to add things like this because remember that's version specific. If the coder writes a few lines of different code now all of a sudden this might be 1750 or 1802 or something like that. Okay so let's let's delve a little bit further uh, and then we'll go a little bit up. So first a bit deeper in and 
uh, let's have a look at the frames. So each of these frames is a function call, if you will, right? So each time a different function is called, as we said before. And um, let's go and have a look what is happening in a particular frame. So in this case, I want to swap into or jump into frame eight. And um, great, here we can uh, see repeated uh, what uh, what we have there. And I also have the source still available, and, and this is really great because if you have the source available, you're going to be seeing right in line in GDB the actual code that that uh, that is being executed or where it failed or it stopped uh, right here in GDB. So in this case we were in SQL class CC1799 and indeed uh, 1799 debug assert timer equals to null. And remember that that was the message that we that we had before in the assertion message. And so you can see where it's coming from. So when you enter those few things uh, maybe now a much more uh, specific string would be something like this in Google or, or even without the assert. So you know you can see how you can dig for information uh, just to find bug reports. It's a little bit separate from what we're trying to do here. Okay so in this case, it's giving me a little warning and saying, "Hey, your source file is more recent than the executable." And you know that happens when your source code is just a little bit off. Maybe you've updated it via bazaar or something like that, uh, which is probably the case here. So again, you want in principle a hundred percent match. If you do not have a hundred percent match, you can be slightly ambitious and um, just check out the surrounding code and hope that you know in that particular file you're debugging um, the line numbers are still the same. In our case, it looks pretty good, pretty good because we know that an assertion happened. We know that it was at line 1799, and it's still exactly the same. So, if we type list here, then you can see the surrounding code. You can see how very powerful this is. And if I press enter, I'm going to see the next line numbers, and you can specify behind list which line numbers you want, and so on and so on. So it's quite powerful. So let's have a little read. Ensure that no one is using THD. Ah, but remember the recursive call? So, and we got some sort of mutex locking happening. So, isn't that interesting? Ensure that no one is using THD. But it seemed like we were already using THD. So it seems like THD called itself uh, and then, you know, THD was using itself already, so maybe that's why the assertion failed. Just one theory, right? It needs a developer to go and debug this further and check out what's happening. But you can see how good an idea you can get just from some very simple and straightforward debugging. So let's just jump out of here and go back in so that you can get a summary. Okay, so we're on BT. We see our backtrace. We know that this is the thread that failed because we got a board, a board uh, happening here. We got um, the handle fertile signal happening here, and um, and so yeah, this looks like the thread that has actually terminated. So if we go frame eight list, and we got the same information. So it's fairly straightforward. Three commands will give you quite a bit of information about what happened. And just remember, if this was not a thread uh, that failed, you could go thread apply all bt. And when you log a bug report, you definitely want to include a thread apply all bt to start with, because um, maybe some other thread was doing something which uh, triggered uh, this particular assert in another thread. In this case, it looked like it was just simply the, the thread itself that, in a way, looped into itself, if you will, or um, yeah, looped into the function twice. But it could be that there is an interaction between threads that, that happens regularly as well. So let's have a little look at uh, a more higher level view uh, what the other threads are doing. Because it's sometimes quite interesting to have a scan. Okay, so this is just doing some IO, AIO, and uh, this thread is doing some IO too. Um, might be just waiting for something, who knows. If you see this, uh, pthread con time wait, then 
uh, this is something you see quite regularly so this thread is clearly waiting uh, nothing to worry about there ah sick wait so maybe this thread um, was doing something oh, it was uh, spawning a new thread but then you know maybe it got aware of oh there's something happening there's a signal happening or whatever so you better just wait so that that's that's uh, interesting um in this case it looks like there was some sleep happening or yeah some sort of sleep happening uh, another time to wait, remember, you see that regularly, uh, again, the I.O. So you can see the similarity, right? There's, there's not much happening here, these are just some background threads. Um, okay, here we got a very interesting one. This might actually be related to the crash, who knows. So, okay, some, some transaction purging going on. Yeah. Another waiting thread, IO thread, another waiting, another waiting, uh, another one that is waiting for whatever happened with the signal, I assume, and so on and so on. Okay, so a waiting thread. Okay, so you can see there was one or two other threads that were doing something interesting and otherwise there was just a main thread that crashed. This was a single threaded uh, testing run that we were doing here if you remember. Um, so once you start a testing run with 30, 40, 50, 60, 200 client threads you might see much more interesting interactions between threads. However, what is very interesting, I have always found that most of the issues that I saw, and I'm talking 80 to 90, probably even 95% of the issues, are single thread reproducible. Um, so there seem to be very little uh, bugs of uh, inter-thread uh, events or communication going wrong. Uh, and that's uh, that's good to know, right? It means that uh, at least the threading side of things is, is uh, quite well isolated and it's quite working quite well. And this is across the board for uh, uh, for, from what I've seen. So we have a frame which I would just think about like a function call. So here you uh, see frame 8 uh, and the function THD and uh, you know what a, a trace or a backtrace is. So it's basically uh, this information. You also know uh, what threads are, uh, as we've seen, if you remember the picture with all different threads, and so you know, this is one particular thread, and here's another thread. So, you've already learned quite a lot if you've never heard about this. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's draw the picture from the perspective of threads uh, contain, uh, I shouldn't really say it like this, but you get what I mean contain traces and each trace contains certain frames. We're going to dive one particular um, level deeper. So each thread contains a number of functions that are happening. Um, now we're going to jump into variables. So, so far we've looked into threads, traces, individual frames. Now we're going to go deeper and you can see that here um, certain variables are passed into these uh, particular functions. Uh, see for instance here uh, block underscore pthread, that's a variable name, equals true. Right? So a boolean variable probably. So let's take that as an example. We jump into frame 10 and by the way many of these um, uh, different instructions have shortcuts so you can go uh, thread tray or THR1 and you can see it jumping back and forth F10 or frame 1, frame 10 and you can see the jumping just fine. Okay, so let's have a look quickly at the list command again. So now we're working in uh, thread 1 just run a backtrace, so there's our thread 1 and we're working in frame 10 and we're listing what code was being run there Okay, so okay, clean up errors now before possibly waiting for a connection, for a new connection. And we were at 2848, 
delete thread. Oh, very interesting. So, you know, you can see how uh, the soup is getting a little bit thicker <laughs> right about there. So, let, let's have a look. So we know that block p thread is true, but if we didn't know that, you could check uh, p thread, and sure enough, it's uh, it's true. Now let's list uh, from 2800 onwards. So this is just a bit earlier, just a bit before uh, 2843. And we'll just uh, keep browsing 43. Was it 43 or 34? Um, oh, uh, 848. 848. Okay, so there's our uh, uh, item that went wrong. So, you know, and there we can see the block B thread being being changed. So if, okay, so we know that, if we go back, we know that it's true. So, you know, let's have a look. Well, clearly that means that this should be, well, if this had happened, then block B thread would have been false. So this one will almost definitely be false as well. And indeed it's zero. Um, so you can see uh, interesting ways of checking variables. You can read through the code. Uh, you can pretty, pretty much check any variable that you're seeing. Um, of course it has to be relevant to the context you're working in and, and so on. Uh, there's your declaration by the way of, of that particular variable. So uh, the other thing is here, and, and this is very interesting, the THD uh, variable is used. And when you try and print that one, it shows you something a little bit cryptic. Now what it's telling you is that this THD variable is stored at this particular memory address and it's just going to be a little bit larger than um, just a false or true. So the way to see that is you simply had a little asterisk before uh, the uh, definition. Okay, great, so that was a lot of output. Let me just scroll back. Up, 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 up. Okay, so simply you p t h d gives you a pointer. You um, add a little asterisk and you copy the full detail. And great, you get the full output. You can see here it's starting to list the full output. Now this THD is a very interesting uh, array. You can find a lot of information here about uh, various things that are happening um, if you want to browse through it and have a have a look. But there are some, some interesting things you can find out, uh, various uh, bits of status, you know, what is happening, uh, what what are certain uh, variables set to, etc, etc, etc. So you can, for instance, here see the state of the optimizer, you know, what sort of conditions have been set for the optimizer. I'll assume that's, that's what it is. You, you would need to be a developer to know for sure. So let's just browse a little bit further and see what other inf interesting information we can find. So sometimes when you are running this within uh, a client session, um, you can see the actual uh, query that was being used and you can extract the last query using a fairly simple straightforward command. Uh, there's a blog post on that on the MySQL performance blog if you're interested. Okay, I just skip through. Interesting uh, Interesting message here. No? One has to wonder why a non English message. Oh, here. Yeah, very interesting. So, main DA a message. Okay, just go through. Okay, so. It doesn't look that interesting this time, but if you have um, 
a particular SQL statement running at the time of uh, the crash, or that particular SQL statement when it has caused uh, the crash or when it's caused the assertion, uh, then you can have a browse through and uh, see what else you can find. So we've looked into how you can print certain variables, how you can jump into a frame, see the code. So remember the code has to be uh, present at exactly the same location. You could go and try and download the code and just create these directories and put it in there. GDP will automatically try and access it. If it's not there, that's fine too, but you will not get to, get to see the code. So you can just have your browser window open on the side and go and browse through the code of that particular version and just match it that way. But it is kind of handy to, to have it available as you can see. So what else, what else can we do? Um, if you type the help command you're going to get a fair bit of information. Um, for instance you could run GDB live against MySQL D and set a few breakpoints. So let's have a look at breakpoints. So you can see there's a fair bit of commands just uh, simply for breakpoints. Um, and there's lots of other things there, status. So you can have a browse through. It's quite interesting to have a browse through and see uh, what else you can do. Um, now, how about if we wanted to log our output? Set log on. That will log to gdb.txt. And, and this is why I've got this local echo of uh, commands, because otherwise this particular bit that you're typing doesn't get logged into the uh, output file. But if you turn on the logging uh, and you have this uh, echo of commands, then they will end up in the txt file as well. So if I simply go through and um, do some of the things that we've been doing before. By the way, each time you print a certain variable, there is this $5, $6, $7. See if I do it again, it will be uh, $7. So that's just simply the number of times you have accessed uh, a particular variable, not uh, per variable, right? So if I do uh, pthd, see that will be 8, and if I do uh, block p thread again it will be 9 and so on. So it's basically just the times, uh, the number of times that you've tried and printed a certain variable or any variable. Okay so if we now quit and we have a look at our txt file um, sorry, small mistake gdb.txt then you can see here that it's locked all of the commands that we've typed and it's even inserted this nice bit of uh, source code that we listed so all of the output gets neatly stored and you can upload this to a bug report uh, for the developer to have a look at. Okay so let's go and have a look at some of the other uh, items that we prepared before um, Okay, so here was a different, uh, different two different bugs, a 12. Go into our data directory. We connected with uh, MySQL D of which we'd grabbed a copy beforehand. Okay, so looks all good. Okay, so this time we have a long stack trace. So let's have a look and starting from the bottom again. Um, so all this looks similar like we had in the last one, but now we're actually going to uh, do a certain command. So we can assume that this is coming from the client, and this was what I was saying before. Sometimes it's quite clear that whatever is happening in a particular thread is coming from a client. Okay, dispatch command, and we can see here that it was executing some particular uh, SQL statement. Uh, it's trying to parse that and uh, it goes on from there. So an insert, okay, I was starting uh, going to execute it, I was starting to execute it, uh, insert, uh, writing a record, uh, doing a row insert, and eventually here, just before it failed, row insert clustered index entry by modify. Okay, so somewhere there is seemingly a bug in that particular function. So let's jump into that 
most interesting uh, frame. And again, if you wanted to search for this particular bug online, you could grab this particular frame name here, this one, and uh, you could possibly also add insert. Uh, sometimes uh, that's mentioned in the bug that it was on an insert command. Um, but but just searching on this, I mean, it's very specific, right? So you're not going to have to scan too many pages just to find it, and you could maybe include just a little bit more uh, frames from the uh, backtrace so that uh, it might be easier to find the bug that you're looking for. Okay, so in this case um, we have an, uh, an assertion and well, what's interesting here before we had this uh, debug assertion, so if you remember it, it looks something like debug assert uh, timer equals null. Um, so compare this with UTAD, so this is an optimized assertion, I think, while before we were looking at a debug assertion. So let's have a look at the surrounding code. And, um, okay, so we have uh, something being, uh, something going wrong with this particular line of code, 365, right? That's the one we're looking at in this particular source code file. Uh, and that's uh, that's what caused this assertion. So it's up to the developers to go and debug exactly what is happening here. But you could uh, uh, have a look at some variables, for instance, p mode, you can see that that is one, um, uh, and so on. So p, t, h, r, maybe. Let's have a look at that one. Okay, so this is uh, more or less as expected uh, an address again. So what we're going to do here is that. And we get the full output of that particular array. You could have a look at some other ones, P entry, uh, and again we could do the same thing. We're not going to spend too much uh, time on that, it's quite clear. Uh, here there's a pointer, so let's have a look at that one. And again you can use print instead of P. Um, okay, so let's have a look at what it is we got here. And so on, so it's pointing to something else. Okay, so you know this this requires a developer to go and uh, analyze what the particular uh, issues that we're seeing here. But you get an idea as to how you can delve in, and, and this time we got to see the query, right? And we know that it's the client executing, so that's that's quite interesting. Let's have a look at what some of um, the other threads are doing. So again, thread 1 was indeed our uh, failing thread, which is not always the case, but now it was. Uh, so we've got a number of waiting threads again, and thread secret info, the time to wait, you should recognize it by now. So not much interesting so far. No, nope. so there's not much else going going wrong. So it seems like this would be, at least for developers, uh, possibly quite easy because we've got a single threaded run, we have a very clear and clean stack trace, we know where the error issue is, we've we've uh, seen that you know these two things should not be equal so you know maybe something is going wrong there um, and then it's up to the developer to find out what particular item caused these two to be uh, equal uh, oh, sorry, unequal, um, and so on. So that was quite interesting. Let's have a look at uh, the last one we got here. Um, subdirectory. Okay, so again we're in some sort of client uh, action uh, and here you can see the full uh, query that was being executed. It's always very powerful to have the query that went wrong because of course you can just you know dump the tables that this particular query was accessing and uh, uh, and and print it. Uh, in this particular case it might even be just a single query. Let's have a look. Oh well, we can always give it a go. Um, so, um, back on a server. So we'll just start up the server. 
You can see all these handy scripts by the way that make your life so much easier. They're all there. You can go and download it. Just type visit our branch land launchpad Percona QA and uh, you'll get a lot of handy scripts. So the one that I was using here is startup.sh but you can see all these scripts that are there. Okay, so uh, what that startup script does is it creates these handy little utilities. You can go start and client. Let's execute this. Okay, so that doesn't immediately crash the server. So there was probably some other statement that came somewhat earlier in the SQL file uh, that caused this particular statement to fail somewhat later. Or maybe it was a command line option or something like that that was used. That's also a possibility. Uh, no, that was not the one we were looking at. 14. Nope, oh, core. Uh, force of habit. Okay, so that particular statement, uh, we know that it's crashed, uh, but let's see. Okay, we've got some sort of join happening here, very interesting uh, in combination with that statement. Um, okay. Ah, you know, maybe related to char sets. You know, char set UTF32. So straight away that gives you maybe a little bit more of an idea again what is happening. So let's just jump into that frame list. And in this particular case it was um hmm, that's interesting. Here this was two one Oh, sorry, my mistake. Frame eight. So always watch what you're doing, right? Uh, I noticed here this says two line two one three eight, and see here I just typed a forgot a space. I listed, and what I was getting was the line numbers weren't matching. So that told me that something was wrong. So if if you watch what you're doing, you can you can easily correct mistakes. Okay, so now we are in the right spot, and we can see the TLN uh, that we the, the actual assertion message CLAN 4 that we saw before uh, and so okay well let, let's have a look at TLAN 1 and straight away you can get an idea what's going wrong there so some sort of uh, char set issue where you know maybe the length of the number of bytes or something like that wasn't correct or clearly some sort of low priority bug right how often are we going to run in this particular into this particular issue not not uh, not very important but you get an ID. See, we got quite far. Uh, you could go a little bit further, browse a little bit through the code and find out why actually TLAN ended up being one um, and uh, and so on. And, you know, but in the shortest amount of time, you could actually work out what the bug is in the code. Okay, so let's have a look. I told you before that we're saving a copy of MySQL D. So what are all these other files here? Well, they're library dependencies. Um, libraries that come from the OS uh, that uh, it's handy to have them together with the core file. Now, um, just as an easy way, you can uh, use this script. Um, LDD files and it basically uh, does an LDD on MySQL D and it just extracts all the particular uh, files that it needs. Uh, if extra backup is there, it does the same um, and it copies them into the local directory. So if I go and remove all these uh, lib files, I can do this because the, those files would not have changed on my system since we last did it. And so you just got the MySQL D binary there and I just simply run LDD files. Bingo. So now it's copied these uh, libraries from wherever they are on the system into this directory and you can tar bold this up and include it with the core dump. So what do you want to include when you log a bug report? You want to uh, include the MySQL D binary, you want to include all the LDD files, uh, all the libraries, and you can get that by running this script. So again, if you wanted to uh, get Percona QA, all you have to do is uh, install Bazaar, so you know, uh, 
so do your more apt-get um, install bazaar um, and then after that visitor branch launchpad procona qa um, and uh, so you need uh, thirdly uh, the core file um, and that way a developer would be able to do pretty much everything they want they can uh, view the core file analyze it use mysql to use your libraries now remember that a core file may potentially contain confidential information when you send it um, you know it might have the query you're running uh, and that query might contain uh, data so you know always keep that in mind if you do want to send a core dump you might just want to send it to a support team rather than actually uploading it to a bug report or if you're happy to upload it to a bug report you can do so too okay so Let's have a little look. We had an introduction. We talked about traces and all uh, its different names. We talked about frames and variables. We had a look at some commands and how you can get more help with the help command. Uh, we looked at library dependencies. And um, also, let's have a look at the C filled command, which is very handy. So, we'll just go back to where we were before and we'll jump into our data directory and let's have a or sorry the log directory okay so this is our uh, log file and if you look here by the way you know the log file is always very interested interesting right because it shows you a resolution message uh, and it even shows you in which particular uh, file and line number it was now if you look at uh, this particular uh, trace and we're just ignoring the OS uh, parts here for the moment or or the parts relating to MySQL dehandling the, the the error that has happened then you can still see uh, an alike looking backtrace here but you know this is mangled in C++ so the way you can do this is you go get filled so you've just basically sent that into C++ filled and let's have a look at out and go to the end and now you can see that our stack trace has been very cleanly resolved. You, you recognize the same sort of stack trace uh, as we saw uh, inside GDB. So this might be one handy way if uh, for whatever reason you don't have a core dump or you only have the error log or whatever else you can use C++ filled to demangle this output and uh, if you compare it with this you know this looks much more confusing right it's how how are you possibly going to see the nice output that we get here right so it looks very different okay so C++ filled very handy utility to do uh, these sort of things there is also two guides that I'd like to point you to and uh, that's a cheat sheet uh, from an earlier talk that I did and from crash to test case uh, if you're interested in finding out a bit more information about how to go about debugging so you know you can on, go on Google uh, go, actually goo.gl and uh, HTTPS that is and, and add the suffix rrm uppercase b qi uh, for the second one uh, and this is just coming from Dropbox uh, goo.gl 10 uh, notice that's an O not a zero O five uppercase M Z uppercase M and then you can uh, get these files and I'll just have a very quick look at them so here's the sheet sheet um, and on the first page of that it's just basically a, uh, an overview of what to do when you have a particular uh, crash or error or, or SQL error or whatever and um, on the second page there is a GDB sheet sheet um, so with uh, a number of the things that we've looked at uh, it also show you how to do live debugging for instance and we haven't looked at this but you can just go GDB bit um, and uh, point it to bit number we might actually have a quick look into that too I just okay so if we start a long sleep in the background uh, as a background process and um, we connect into this uh, particular uh, process and you could do it this way or uh, of course you could uh, um, and by the way if you break into a particular process it breaks into that 
binary and whatever it's running at that moment will straight away pause or halt and when you quit it will continue running you can see it here being detached uh, from the program and that program will keep running right so it's, it's relatively safe you could sometimes uh, crash the program by doing this um, especially like if it's depending on uh, some sort of weights or uh, time mats or, or things like that you could cause serious issues so don't do this on a live production server but otherwise it's quite safe to break into a process and start debugging it if you're if you're not on a live machine um, so what I was going to say you can of course um, have a look at your process list and uh, there you see the sleep uh, process and so you can uh, see uh, the bit here uh, again okay so we've uh, broken in and straight away we get an indication as to where we're at uh, and, and notice here that uh, no debugging symbols are found because of course this is an optimized binary so this is not a debug binary however you can get the information it's kind of nice that it tells you by running debug info install for the core utilities uh, which sleeps part of and that's very similar to mysql d where you could install uh, debug info as, as a separate uh, add-on package to get uh, the resolution so uh, nonetheless, even though it's it's not there, um, you can still get a, a, a backtrace. I'll just jump out for a second and, and show you what this looks like if I want to do this. So you can install the debug info package for core utilities. Takes a little bit of time, seems like there's a failing repo there. Okay, so this is going to take a little bit of time. I'll just pause it for a second and come back when it's installed. Okay, so that's completed. So you've got an idea about how you can install that. So you don't have to use yum or something like that, you just use debug info install. And of course for MySQL D it's very different, right? You download the RPM package, you install it using the RPM utility, uh, etc. Okay, so this time we get a lot more uh, interesting information it seems. So let's run a backtrace. Aha, look at how good that looks compared with before. Before we were just seeing the function names, now we actually see the variables and, and what is happening too. Um, and maybe we can even jump to a frame and sure enough we get the source code too. Very impressive. Um, so we could see... Um, Let's have a look, for instance, at what's happening here. Yeah, I got a bit of information there, and we've we've seen before how you can print this. Oh, sure, thousand, and that was how many seconds that we started it with. So you can see how how powerful it, how more powerful debugging can happen when you've got the source code and when you've got uh, uh, debug info packages installed. Okay, so let's have a look at the backtrace. Um, so some other commands, live debugging commands, so you can continue the execution. And now we have the sleep continuing. So as I said before, when you break in, the execution stops. Now it's continuing, right? So we could uh, control C. And what's happening now is it's breaking back into the program. So it's sort of as if I started GDB again. Um, and it actually tells you it, uh, the program was running and it received the interrupt, that was my control C, and we find ourselves in this place now, which might or might not be different from before, and it's it's the same, right? So there's probably some sort of loop. Uh, now that we have the source code, let's go and have a quick look. Um, so we're at line 81 here. Okay, so I, I don't particularly understand this code, but uh, normal system. Okay, so maybe it's just doing some sort of uh, system call to wait for a particular time to pass or something like that. Who knows? We can also step line by line through the code and really go into uh, debugging each particular line, step through it. We can also set a breakpoint. For instance, um, let me just jump out of this and we'll start. Um, we're going to. Um, what is it again? Seven or something like that? No, two. Okay, 
Okay, so I just killed the, the sleep that was running and I'm going to start a very short sleep, uh, 7 seconds and I'll have to be quick, 24028 Okay, so we broke in, the, the program has stopped running so we've got a little bit of time now so we'll look at the break trace and we're going to say, and I, I hope this is going to work uh, Add me a breakpoint, and the command for breakpoint is break and RPL none asleep. Uh, okay, so it set a breakpoint at that particular function at line 49. Uh, that's where that particular function has its home. And we're going to continue running. And Ah, it exited normally. <laughs> okay, so in any case, let's assume that somehow it would have gone in and out of functions. You remembered a very long uh, stack trace from. Um, from the other uh, MySQL D uh, program, uh, there it would go in and out of functions, and you could set a particular breakpoint on a particular function. What I've done before is I saw an error message in the error log, and I was very interested in finding out what certain variables were at the point where it was printing that error message. So what I did was I set a breakpoint on the function that actually prints that message. Then I ran GDB. Uh, uh, GDB. Uh, sorry, I ran. Uh, I. I continued the execution of MySQL D when that particular function was hit uh, GDB would break into or, or pause or stop or come back to the command line um, and would allow you to debug and so I was able to print the variable names that I was interested in so you can see how how the breakpoint in a way is very similar to you know me running uh, control C sorry wrong Two eight eight three eight. Me continuing to run this process and then Control C. Uh, a breakpoint would look very similar. It just wouldn't have a, a signal interrupted. Would just simply uh, have a breakpoint. And then you can go and uh, debug your backtrace. Would show the backtrace of whatever is happening at that very moment in time. So that gives you an idea of live debugging. And again, you know the. GDB is detaching and uh, uh, sleep continues running uh, as you can see it's running there and just these other sleeps are uh, just one of my other tools that uh, that is probably sleeping uh, before it continues running so don't worry about those so let's just jump back to uh, the overview so we've seen live uh, debugging you can also uh, instead of uh, doing this you can also start GDB arcs and point it to a particular uh, I don't know if this will work right and then we can say run and it runs uh, normally right so again here we're saying start GDB with this argument but we're not actually starting this program yet and then R or run will start this particular program and again control C and continue control C quit yes and this time the sleep is not running anymore because we started it within GDB and this time as it said the program would be killed because we were running it under GDB. So you can see the difference between GDB breaking into a program or uh, GDB actually starting a program with the run command. So that is what this particular bit is showing here. So we've seen BT, BT full. Oh, that's a very interesting command too. Um, so let's just sleep again. We're pretty tired anyway. And just kidding. <laughs> and just seeing if you're still awake. Two, one, two, three. Backtrace. Okay, BT full. Now look at how BT full looks different. Uh, it's basically the same, right? But it also gives you all the local variables, which is kind of really interesting. Um, so if you go try to apply all BT full in MySQL D, you get lots of output. So you want to make sure that you got your lock on. Try to apply pt full, uh, exit out of there and then you can upload that txt file to the website. 
to the bug report website. Okay, uh, thread we've seen, frame we've seen, list we've seen, p we've seen, info locals, um, yeah, print local variables, speaks for itself. We've also seen about break, how you can set a breakpoint C for continue execution when you're running live. Quit, uh, which is obviously exiting GDB, and as you know by now, exit doesn't work. Um, so you can go and have a look at this uh, blog post. The URL has changed, it's now uh, percona.com forward slash blog. But you can just search in Google for obtain last executed statement from optimized core dump. And this blog post, as well as one that's linked from it, uh, a newer one, give you an idea about how to extract the last executed query. Um, we've already partly seen that, how you can go into the do command frame and use uh, uh, the backtrace to see the statement that uh, was being executed. However, if you have 30 or 40 different threads, then uh, you're going to need to script it a little bit. So in the old versions of uh, MySQL, this was the way to print the uh, query string. However, um, if we just jump into Percona QA, so I'm in the Percona QA directory, which you can get, as I said, with uh, branching uh, Percona QA from Launchpad. There is um, an extract query or GDB script, and this is a script that you can run within uh, GDB. And when you run this, it uh, presets uh, some nice formatting options, and this will log to TMP GDB.parse, and uh, it will go to each particular thread and try and extract the query string for both the old version and the new version. So if either one will one of the two will always fail, but that's okay. You won't notice that so much in the uh, in the log. It will be mostly about the uh, getting the queries out. So if you execute this, you will get a nice list of all the queries which were running at the time of a crash. And you might remember before how we had the bQuery prep reducer script and I'm just going to reduce to remove the reducer files which is fine to do and this script is going to recreate them and now you can see here it says obtaining queries from the trial score dump so the trial is the particular run that that we're talking about 12 or 14 or whatever and you can see how it uh, accesses the core file and gets the queries out and then it also extracts them from the error log so one thing that new QA people, uh, one mistake that they often make is they have a nice SQL trace and they run that SQL trace through uh, the through MySQL D with either the command line or directly uh, through some AP C API, and the server does not reproduce the same crash now. And then the the question is why didn't it do that? So the reason is that. Uh, very often the statement that actually crashed <laughs> is not included. So you've run everything up to the statement that was just going to fail and then the last statement is not included. So you know this script does it nicely for you. It, it takes the query wherever it finds one and you can see sometimes there is no statements in the core dump which is fine. Um, but it looks at the error log, gets the last state, gets the statement from there, it looks at the core dump and then it adds it three times because sometimes you need to execute a statement uh, a few times in a row just to trigger a bug more easily and it adds those three times. So if you use something like this then your issues are going to be much more reproducible. So if you're a customer out there and, and you got a core dump and you think you've got a test case but for some reason the test case is not working, go ahead and use the script, uh, the GDB script which this by the way in the background is using uh, when it when it extracts the query here. It's using the, the that GDB script I was just showing you before in the background. So when you see that, um, uh, go into your core dump, extract the older running queries. Uh, sometimes, you know, in this case, it's one just because I was running one threads. But if you're running 20 or 30 threads, you might get five or 10 queries that were executing at the same time. Add them three or four times to the end of your test case, and then just rerun the test case, and you're going to see a much higher success ratio. By the way, our, our success ratio of reproduction is 95 up to 100%, like we are pretty much able to reproduce almost all issues that we see in QA, which is 
which is very very high uh, that used to be um, in other places before it used to be 60 percent uh, maybe 70 but um, so much higher now okay so let's just jump back uh, here so um, you can compile GDB and this is giving you the instructions you can get the latest GDB it's probably uh, a bit higher than 751 now and uh, this is how you can simply compile it or you can just go sudo yum install GDB uh, as an alternative to this and and install it from um, from your OS provider uh, repositories now you can take some of these items uh, that you often run and put them into a GDB init script uh, or you can just execute them every time and so here we got the GDB syntax double SQL D and porting it to the core and for um, actually uh, when you log a bug report you can just uh, copy and paste all this and just uh, paste that into the GDB command line and it will nicely generate two files GDB stand and GDB full which both contain all threads but the GDB full will have all the local variables as well if you include this together with your core dump, together with your MySQL D binary, together with your uh, libraries, all in a bug report, you're going to make the developer very happy. He's going to be able to look at your bug report and go, wow, this is exactly what I needed. I'm going to be able to so much quicker debug this. Um, there's also some information here if you want to use Win the DBG to um, to debug Windows crashes. It's actually very interesting because sometimes when you open a core dump you straight away see that what was causing an issue was an audio driver or, or something like that. So uh, that way you know, oh great, I just have to go and uh, download a new audio driver and my Windows won't be crashing so much anymore. So that's some handy information if you use Windows. Um, let's just go a little bit more. There's also some information about Valgrind, some information about, Arch about ArcG, but as you probably know by now we don't use ArcG anymore, we use pQuery. Um, and just a little bit of a nice introduction to Bash if you've never uh, done any Bash coding. So that's a cheat sheet. Uh, you can go and, and download that at that first URL that I gave. And then uh, the second bit is like a, um, a talk that uh, I gave before. Um, and it has all sorts of information about what to do when your server has any sort of issue. It goes into specifying like, okay, great, we got a server crash, which is very different from you know just an application error or an error in your in, in your log. Uh, it goes on to explain just the different things you can see. Um, why? Um, what I want to show you here is C plus plus field. We've also seen that. Um, so one thing that's very important is when you read, and that's what the RRR++ stands for here, read, 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 and read again, um, you, you want to make sure that you capture all the information of, of simple lines that are displayed. For instance here, you know, we know it's an assertion failure, fine, but hey, the assertion was an InnoDB, and hey, row update, it was probably doing an update. We also know the line number in this particular file. Um, we also know what happened. We know at what time it happened. We know what the variables were. Oh, it might have something to do with fake changes and so on. So just really carefully read what it is you see, and you might add, you might figure out what then you thought would, uh, would be possible originally. So... Uh, again, you know, if you read here, prefix lang is greater than is, is greater than sec lang. So you know, fairly straightforward. Okay. Um, yeah, you can see some errors in the error log that will uh, maybe help you uh, debug what particular issue you're seeing later on in the error log. Um, so you know, the error eleven. By the way, you can look up these errors if you uh, go to the bin directory where the MySQL D binary lives there is a utility that's called parer so p error uh, as in print error parer 11 and if you run that parer 11 it will give you whatever is the specific OS code or MySQL code for for uh, message for that particular code 
Okay, so you can have a browse through. Ah, here's the pair example uh, resource temporarily unavailable, so you get an ID there. Um, the different types of signals uh, we've seen before how you can have uh, an, an uh, a board signal which usually is like some sort of assertion that cost it, uh, etc. 11 usually cost uh, uh, is usually like an actual crash. Um, so yeah, you can go and have a look through and uh, and read a little bit more if you're interested in in uh, debugging further from where we've uh, where we've stopped with the GDB debugging uh, introduction. Okay, that's all. Uh, my name is Rul van der Par. I work for Pacona. I hope you enjoyed this section on debugging. God bless. Bye.